Prisoner of war. I know it's coming, he said breathlessly, a look of horror on his face. It's getting closer now. I can hear the explosions. His jaw was rigid, his breathing rapid, his face constricted. The problem is, I can't see anything. We can't see over the tops of the ditches. His voice tensed even more, he was clearly getting agitated, the terror building. I knew that I had to act quickly before the experience overwhelmed him. Let's go back to an earlier, happier time, I said in a gentle voice, a time before these explosions started. John took a deep breath and exhaled, his grim countenance fading as he settled into the chair. Although his body was in my psychotherapy office in the 21st century in Austin, Texas, his mind was deep in a non-ordinary state of consciousness, and his awareness was somewhere in Bavaria nearly a hundred years ago, experiencing a prior lifetime. Long before I was a therapist, I was fascinated by the concept of reincarnation. As a boy, I often wondered who I might have been in another life. As an adult, I discovered the work of Dr. Brian Weiss through his best-selling book Many Lives, Many Masters. In training directly under Drive Weiss, I found him to be different from many other so-called spiritual teachers or workshop leaders. He refused to sensationalize the work and wasn't afraid to talk about the limits of regression therapy or to remind people that regressions themselves were not proof, in a scientific sense, that reincarnation existed. He was, however, adamant that regression therapy could be profoundly healing. Why would someone want a past life regression? It is not enough for my clients to remember that they were a peasant in the Middle Ages. For the regression to be healing involves not only understanding the roots of a negative pattern or recurrent issue, which often arches over many lifetimes, but also an emotional release so that the clarity can be fully internalized. A successful scientist, John was curious about reincarnation, but he had come to me for a past life regression specifically because he had a hard time connecting with others. He was in his 60s with thinning hair, a salt and pepper mustache, and piercing eyes. His wife told him that he could be cold and distant at times, and both his adult children were estranged from him. John's initial interaction with me had been respectful and courteous, but hardly warm. This guy would never make it as a greeter at Walmart, I thought to myself as John curtly announced that he doubted that he could be hypnotized. I have regressed thousands of people, both individually and in groups, many of whom had insisted the same thing. While I do believe that people cannot be hypnotized against their will, I have come to believe that the vast majority of people can be hypnotized, to some degree, given enough time with a skilled clinician. I would guess that over 90% of my regression clients go deep enough on their first attempt to experience some past life memories. Bearing this in mind, I took steps to induce hypnosis slowly and gently with John, always reminding him that he could safely come out of it at any time if he wished. He gradually went deeper and deeper, following my instructions. Some 30 minutes after inducing the trance state, I gave John the suggestion to go to the events that led to his chronic emotional aloofness. His subconscious led him to an experience in World War I, when he was a buck private in the German army, deep in the hell of trench warfare. I was concerned that this incident might be confusing or initially overwhelming, hence my instructions to go back to an even earlier time so that he might be able to put his battle experience in perspective. Able to put his battle experience in perspective. Following my lead, John described himself earlier in that incarnation as a teenager, growing up with six siblings in a middle-class family on a verdant farm. He fell in love with an attractive village maiden named Helga, and he saw himself going to her farmhouse to court her. Truth is, I barely know her. We've kissed each other once or twice as I walked her home from church. He had a broad smile. But I think I am in love and want to marry her. She comes from a good family, hardworking, salt-of-the-earth kind of people, like me. John volunteered for the army, to serve the fatherland, and because it was his only chance to get enough money to marry Helga. To my surprise, John told happy stories about life in boot camp. The comradeship of his fellow soldiers and his sergeant warmed his spirits. Some of them are smart, some are stupid, but they are all good men. Many are farmers, just like me. And we get one hot meal every day, he added, grinning with amazement. Apparently, this was better treatment than he had expected. John continued on with stories of endless marches. It's tiring, but not so bad, really. You can rest on one foot and then the other, 
he said, making what was doubtless a common joke of the time with a forced cheerfulness. The problem is, you can't ever lie down and rest. You have to keep marching. You have to, you have to. Dot dot quote. He swallowed hard, fighting back his grief and weariness, ever the good soldier. With an abrupt chuckle, he shook off the intensity. The men just kid about it and we keep going. Under my direction, John moved ahead to his arrival at the trenches, where the intolerable waiting for the war began. We know it's coming, he said ominously, but we don't know when. We wait for days. I asked him how he passed the time. We laugh and joke, he replied with a half-hearted smile. But we don't ever talk about our families or girls back home. It would just be too painful, too personal. I think we are afraid that if we thought about it too much, we really might desert. At once, John became more animated. It's here now, he said, his eyes darting beneath his closed eyelids. It's here, and there's smoke and flashes, and I can't see anything. His breathing was rapid. Oh God, oh God, we are just firing into the darkness, we don't even know what we are doing, and... And... He trailed off, his voice thick with emotion. I reminded him that these were memories and that he couldn't be physically hurt by looking at them now in hypnosis. He was safe in my office. It's okay, he said. It's over now. I never felt any pain. He paused for a long moment, his face enigmatic. I'm looking down at the battlefield. I must have left my body behind. There are bodies everywhere. All I can see is my have left my body behind. There are bodies everywhere. All I can see is my leg. I suddenly realized what he meant by the statement. It wasn't that all he could see was his leg, all that was left was his leg. His brow knitted as the grief became palpable. It's so sad. The guys were good guys, the Sarge was good. John's face became tense, his breathing labored. A tear crept out of his eye. But if everyone is so good, how could this happen? His voice was breaking. How could this happen? I sat in silence for several minutes, simply allowing him this cleansing emotional release. After a while, he heaved a sigh. There's a light in the distance, on the horizon. I watched John, it was as though his face were bathed by a gentle glow. It's quiet there, no smoke, no explosions, he said wistfully. I think it's the sun. No, wait. He seemed puzzled. No, it's brighter than the sun. All the smoke is going away. See yourself going to the light, I whispered. John's expression softened, the horror of the carnage falling away as he found himself floating in a brilliant, sacred light. He was making contact with something eternal. A gentle, peaceful smile came over his face, his eyes moist with a different kind of tears. I asked him what he had learned from that lifetime. I was loyal and hardworking in that life, and I still am in my current life. I saw the senselessness of war, but I also seemed to learn of its inevitability. This accounted for both several happy years in his current life spent doing community volunteer work to make a difference, and also dropping out of college to enlist in the Vietnam War because, as he put it, they were going to draft me anyway. Most important, John saw how, in both lifetimes, he had repressed his feelings and avoided the feelings of others. I learned not to feel, not to ask anything too personal about my comrades. In the trenches, it was rude and too painful to ask, it just hurt them, he said, the tears beginning again. But not now, I have to ask my kids and my wife how they are doing. His voice choked with regret. They aren't soldiers, they are people and they want to tell me about their feelings, and I want to know, I want to know, I want to know. I gently placed a hand on his shoulder as he sobbed for a few minutes, and I realized that John was achieving a clarity in a single three-hour session that might have taken months in traditional therapy. He had recognized that his habitual way of dealing with uncomfortable feelings by not discussing them, habitual way of dealing with uncomfortable feelings by not discussing them, while appropriate with his comrades in wartime, could not work for him with his family. Until his regression, John was unconsciously driven by the echo from a past life to avoid discussing his feelings. As a therapist, I recognize that past life regression therapy is not a magic bullet that dramatically resolves all life issues in a single session. Still, in regressing thousands of people in workshops across the country, I have discovered the enormous healing potential in past life memories that run the gamut from traumatic to joyous. A woman remembers that her husband was her lover in another life and has been reunited with her now, and this awareness reinvigorates her marriage. 
A part-time artist commits her life to her craft when she remembers a lifetime in which she had great skill as a painter. A man with a 30-year phobia of doctors is cured once he remembers its roots in a tribal lifetime when a medicine man failed to heal him. All are different experiences, all are healing. Greg Unterberger I am particularly pleased that Greg allowed and encouraged John to review the past life and its lessons, and to understand the connections to his present life. John had been treating family and friends as if they were soldiers, although clearly, in this life, they were not. In this kind of life review, the therapist guides the patient to extract and to understand the important themes and lessons of the lifetime that has just been remembered. When the patient experiences the death of his body in that past life memory, his consciousness becomes aware of floating above that body and entering a light-filled, serene, spiritual state. That is when the therapist begins to conduct the life review, asking questions like, what were the lessons of the life that has just ended? After these lessons have been identified, the therapist may ask, and how do those lessons connect to the present life, to the present time? Recognizing these connections is often a key component of the healing process, it is not merely the reliving of the past life that is healing, but understanding and relating that life to the current one. A therapist will often conduct this kind of life review with the client during a past life regression session. But another type of life review happens to all of us when we die and our consciousness leaves the physical body at the end of each lifetime. This time it is not done with the therapist, but rather with our spiritual guides or other wise beings. It is not a clinical life review but a karmic one. As we are replenished by the beautiful light, our awareness is directed to review the results of our actions while we were on the physical plane. We see the people we have harmed and we feel their emotional reactions, magnified greatly. Similarly, we feel the emotions, again enhanced, of those we have aided and loved. In this manner, we examine all our relationships, and we deeply experience all the anger, hurt, and despair that we have caused but also all the gratitude, appreciation, love, and hope that we have elicited. This life review is not done in a spirit of punishment or guilt. By truly understanding the result of our behavior, we learn the importance of loving kindness and compassion. As the therapist, Greg, in the story that you have just read, demonstrates the former type of life review. As the client, in the story that you are about to read, he demonstrates the latter. Our souls, whether here or on the other side, are blessed with infinite opportunities for learning and growth. So many of us, like John, have died repeatedly in battle. We are born, die in another war, and reincarnate only to fight and die again. At some point, we will realize that we are here to learn and to love. Whenever we kill another person, we also kill a part of ourselves. To be violent, to hate, and to kill are wrong. We fail the lesson, we have to repeat the course. At a deeper level, we can never really be killed because we are consciousness, we are soul. But in this physical dimension we can die corporeally, and we must stop the violence. It is time to... Soulmate This is a part of Zindagi Ki Roshni Consultancy. It has been established for those who have lost someone and for those who are very sad in their life. About 100 PDF books and 20 short audio books of this topic will be sent to those who join it. This data will be sent to their email or WhatsApp. If you want to join this organization then please send WhatsApp message to this number.